The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, um, so we can get started here. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this is, we're just kind of getting set up here. Uh, we, we have um, quite a few people coming into the wait room now and uh, we have our kind of panelists getting in. Um, so we'll probably just give it a minute here and wait for a couple more attendees to show up. And uh, yeah, um, I guess I'll, I'll kind of stay silent for a minute and then I'll come back and do a little bit of an introduction and tell, tell you why you're all here today and who we are. Thanks. Okay, um, I'm seeing a pretty good crowd of people in the uh, waiting room here, so uh, I think that now is as good a time to get started as any. So yeah, thanks everyone so much for coming today. Um, this uh, presentation has kind of been uh, a long time coming. We uh, have uh, kind of rescheduled and now we got a good date and uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that everyone is uh, able to make it. So. Um, I'm Graham Dearden, and I'm from Volunteer Alberta. Uh, the reason that I'm here today to, to chat with you a little bit is to just kind of talk about uh, the organizations kind of putting this presentation on. So uh, Volunteer Alberta is a capacity building organization that uh, helps nonprofits, and voluntary organizations in Alberta um, kind of improve their uh, practices and uh, you know, we, we try to, to work with our kind of nonprofit voluntary community to find out what their needs are and help address them. So that's kind of why we exist. Um, and uh, we've also had a longstanding relationship with Oasis. Um, it, Oasis is a benefits provider and I'll get uh, Brent to uh, do a little bit of an introduction to Oasis as well after this. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, we have worked with Oasis for a really long time to kind of come up with uh, solutions that work for nonprofits and for Volunteer Alberta's membership uh, for years now. So we're really happy to be able to kind of find educational opportunities like the cybersecurity webinar to um, present to nonprofits and uh, um, help them kind of improve their, uh, their practices. So, yeah, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Brent now. Uh, Brent, did you want to talk a little bit about Oasis and a few other things? Yeah, thanks, Graham. Um, so happy to be here today in partnership with Volunteer Alberta to provide you with uh, the cybersecurity awareness training. As you know, we're a not-for-profit provider of group benefits exclusively for not-for-profit organizations across Canada. We're also Volunteer Alberta's preferred partner. Invite each of you to reach out to us to learn more about how we can help your organization get the best and meaningful coverage at the best rate. We aim to keep our rates stable year to year, and we manage that by pooling our organizations together. In fact, our April 2023 renewal is looking like close to no change for all of our member organizations uh, overall. So that's some great news. Uh, I'd like to introduce Sandy Sadowski. Danny is President of IT Business Technologies Limited, which is IT Biz Tech for short. And uh, Danny's provided Oasis's IT backbone uh, and support for many years um, and is an expert in this area. Um, today, you'll learn about the different types of cybersecurity threats facing your organization. Danny will cover how to identify these threats as well as offer some insight into how to protect your organization's sensitive data from cyber attacks. Over to you, Danny. Thank you very much, Brent, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Danny Sadowski, and um, I will be taking you through um, a journey of cybersecurity. We're going to basically learn a lot of things today, so uh, uh, let's begin. And um, first thing I wanted to thank 
Oasis for organizing this event and uh, wanted to thank volunteer Alberta for hosting this webinar. Okay, here's an agenda for today. We're going to basically define cybersecurity and why is it important. Uh, we're going to look at what current threats out there. We're going to take a look at some of the statistics of cybersecurity for nonprofits. We're going to dive into social engineering, um, phishing scams. Uh, we're going to look into different types of ransomware. We're going to uh, work with uh, password tips, okay, how to basically have a better, stronger passwords. And um, we're going to basically look into a little bit more technical aspect of how to protect your organization from cyber threats. And we'll have time for questions. All right, let's begin. So let's define what cybersecurity. Cybersecurity refers to the processes and practices designed to protect networks, devices, programs, and data from attack, damage, or unauthorized access. Now let's see why cybersecurity is important. Cybersecurity is important because it encompasses everything that pertains to uh, protecting your privacy, uh, data integrity, and uh, identity from theft and damage. And by raising collective awareness, we can create more secure working environment. Now let's take a look at the types of malware known to exist today. Uh, on the left side, uh, you can see, we're gonna start from the bottom left, a virus. A virus basically performs unauthorized and harmful action. Next one is adware. Adware designed to display advertisements on your computer, redirect your searches or, uh, uh, actually, uh, sorry, redirect your searches to advertising websites and collect marketing related data about you, such as type of websites you visit. Next one is a rootkit. Uh, it's an application that hides itself deep into operating system and allows hacker access to victims data. Next one is a spyware. Spyware collects data and sends to third party. For example, it takes screenshots of your computer and sends it to a hacker. Next one is a ransomware. Uh, it's a very popular um, malware. What it does, it's, it will encrypt all of your files and demand money to restore them. Next one is a Trojan horse. Trojan horse harms computer software and files. For example, it can delete files or corrupt them. Remote access. Remote access is applications that allows hacker to access your computer remotely without you knowing. Uh, a worm. A worm will infect other computers on the network. For example, the virus will spread through the network. And finally, a keylogger. A keylogger will record every key press you make on a keyboard and will send this information to the hacker. Here's a graph showing amount of malware in the last 10 years from a recent AV test report released this year. As you can see, malware has increased from 182 million in 2013 to approximately 1.3 billion in 2022. And uh, this is basically, you can see, it just keeps increasing and just doesn't stop. Let's take a look at some of the statistics for nonprofits. And uh, the unfortunate numbers are as follows, that nonprofits saw 424% increase in cyber attacks from last year. 33% uh, of nonprofits report using free consumer grade antivirus. So basically uh, consumer, consumer grade antiviruses do not provide pretty much any protection. And that's uh, unfortunately 33% of organizations use it. Uh, ransomware and phishing attacks are the most common threat to nonprofits, and unfortunately, only 14% of nonprofits have ability to mitigate cyber attacks and risks. Let's talk about social engineering and look at threats that fall under this category. I'm going to start with phishing. So phishing attacks, the definition of phishing is a, a practice of using fraudulent emails and copies of legitimate websites to extract users' data 
for the purposes of identity theft. Let's start um, with a list of common phishing attacks used by hackers every day. First one will be email phishing. Victims are contacted by email by someone posing as a legitimate institution to lure individuals into providing sensitive data, such as personally identifiable information, banking and credit card details and passwords. Vishing, also known as a voice phishing, is a combination of the word voice and phishing and refers to phishing scams that take place over the phone. The call will often be made through a fake caller ID, so it looks like it's coming from a trustworthy source. A typical scenario will involve a scammer posing as a bank employee to flag up suspicious behavior on an account. Once they have gained the victim's trust, they will ask for personal information, such as login details, passwords, and a PIN. The details then can be used to empty bank accounts or commit identity fraud. Smishing. Smishing, also known as mobile phishing, is a type of phishing which uses SMS messages as opposed to emails to target individuals. This method involves the fraudster sending a text message to an individual's phone number and usually includes a call to action that requires immediate response. Messages will often claim to be from banks, tax revenue systems, and even your own friends. They may ask you to click on a link, call a number, or they may have to inform you that you are about to receive a phone call from a support member. Spear phishing is a more targeted attempt to steal sensitive information and typically focuses on specific individual or organization. The scammers will often turn to social media to research their victims. Once they have a better understanding of the target, they will start to send personalized emails, which include links, which once clicked will infect your computer with malware. Whaling. A whaling attack is an attempt to steal sensitive information and is often targeted at senior management. Whaling emails are a lot more sophisticated and much more harder to spot. Typically, the email will contain personalized information about the target, organization and the language will be of a corporate in tone. A lot more effort and thought will go into crafting these emails due to the high level of return for the scammers. Finally, baiting. Baiting, as the name, as the name implies, involves luring someone into trap to steal their personal information or infect their computer with malware. Baiters often use offers for free music or movie downloads if users provide their login details. Another popular baiting trick involves leaving a malware-infected device, such as a USB stick, in a place where someone can find it. The scammers rely on human curiosity to complete the scam, and by inserting the device into their computer to see what's on it, and in this case, malware will get instantly installed. Now let's see how phishing scam works. So it begins with attacker sending an email to a victim. So you receive an urgent message and it's from a trusted source, either social network uh, or store you shop online or, the, or your bank. The email looks real, it even uses the logo and perfectly mimic, mimics color scheme of that company. This email is asking you to click on a malicious link that takes you to a fake fraudulent phishing website. And once actually you click on it, it will ask you to provide a login information. Once you type in that login information, that information is passed back to the attacker, which is basically a hacker. And then hacker is actually uses your actual login info to a legitimate website to actually access it and have gain full control. Here's uh, more known phishing scams. Mass phishing. This method is the most common type of phishing and its name suggests messages are sent to as many people as attacker can find to extract their personal and or financial information. These messages may ask for recipient to download a file with malware, visit a malicious website, or respond directly with a personal information. Clone phishing. 
Clone phishing requires the attacker to create a nearly identical replica of the legitimate message to trick the victim into thinking it is real. The email is sent from the address resembling the legitimate sender, and the body of the message looks the same as the previous message. Advanced fee scam, also known as upfront fee fraud, is a scam used by fraudster to extract money from victims by charging processing fees in exchange of an opportunity to either participate in a special financial deal or by providing a share in the inheritance fund. Farm phishing, also known as a website redirector or DNS cache poisoning attack. In a DNS cache poisoning attack, a farmer targets a DNS and changes the IP address associated with the alphabetical website name. That means an attacker can redirect users to a malicious website of their choice. In, the, in that case, even if the victim enters correct website name, they will be redirected to a phony website. Here's a common baiting tactics. Um, notification from a help desk or your system administrator. Usually it will ask you to take action to resolve an issue with your account. Example would be email account has reached its storage limit, which often includes clicking on a link and providing requested information. Advertisement for immediate weight loss or hair growth serves as a ploy to get you to click on a link that will infect your computer or mobile device with malware. Attachment labeled invoice or shipping order will contain malware that can infect your computer or mobile device if open, may contain what it is known as a ransomware, and it will, it's a type of malware that will encrypt all your files and will require, it will, un, unless you pay actually a specified sum of money, and uh, it will be restored. Notification from what appears to be a credit card company. It will indicate someone has made an unauthorized transaction on your account. If you click the link to log in and verify the transaction, your username and password will be collected by the scammer. A fake account on social media site. It will mimic a legitimate person, business, or organization, may also appear in the form of an online game, quiz, or survey designed to collect information from your account. Let's see how you can detect phishing scams. First of all, most scams contain lots of spelling errors. Secondly, the hyperlinks are pointing to a different website. We will see example in the next slide. Thirdly, they use a threatening language and requesting to confirm your login information. Sometimes you will see notifications that you won a lottery that you never played or notification asking for donation. Be aware all of this indicate a phishing scam. Now here's actually an example how hyperlinks work and you can see here we have two identical links showing www.office365.com now when i actually use a mouse to hover over the top one the pop-up message showing me reveals actually the actual link the actual link is that it's showing is office365.com when i actually point uh, when i hover hover with a mouse over the second link, which is identical in name, it's revealing a totally different address, and it's actually showing me a fake link.com. This is just an example of what fraudsters use to actually send you, send you basically a, a fraudulent link with a different name and actually pointing you to a completely different place. So this is the easiest way to identify where the links are pointing, is to hover with your mouse and it will reveal the actual at actual place it will take you. Here's a smishing example, an SMS message that uh, actually comes to your cell phone. And with COVID-19 crisis, uh, fraudsters appear to be redoubling the effort to steal more information and money from unsuspecting users sending fake emails and text messages as a bait. Here's another smishing example. Uh, you have actually CRA notice, which is completely fake. And of course, uh, you have a fake link that asking you to click on to complete your claim. 
Here is another smashing example where you won a lottery that you never played. Here's another example for from Costco. Here's an example from Rogers Communications. And I want to point it out actually that the word customer is misspelled. And you can see that you know right away. And uh, this is essentially again, they are asking to do to take action. Please say why, which basically short for yes. And, and when you press Y and you send it to them, they, they will actually know that this actually phone is real and somebody's actually took, took, took somebody took the bait. And this is actually they will immediately send you more instructions and they may call you to actually um, give you further instructions how to basically extract you know money or data from you. Here's a message from Royal Bank. Again, once you press Y, they will know that you took the bait. Here's a message from TD. And again, you see there is a message that the card has been restricted and uh, they're asking you to take action. And anything you press here will immediately notify them that you, know, you took the bait. Okay, very common message where they're telling you your seller plan was over, overpaid, sometimes overcharged. They use different language, and again, they're asking you for an action to press Y to get refunded. Here's an example of phishing scam, and you can see it's actually coming from Amazon. You can see the Amazon logo, and to make it look more authentic. But when you look closer, you can see on the top that actually it came from Amazon Canada. I'm gonna basically zoom in here and show you. You can see it's missing A. And this is what fraudsters actually do. They actually uh, register domains that are very similar in name, and it's very, e very easy to do it for them because this, these domains are available and they can buy them. And then they create an actual email and send those um, fraudster emails from that account. And this is just one of them. Okay. So um, that's number one. So there's an A missing in a domain. And when you hover over the link, it's actually showing that it's redirecting you to a fake website. Okay. So again, uh, use, using your mouse to hover over the links is very critical and you should be doing this on a daily basis just to verify where is it taking you. Here's an example of phishing scam mimicking Microsoft Office 365. Uh, once again, everything looks very authentic, but when you look closer, you can see the sender email is fake. You can see it on top. It's actually coming from UK and it's actually has nothing to do with Microsoft. Um, email contains also a threat and spelling mistakes, also has grammatical errors and fake email signatures. So you got to look for all of this to identify a phishing scam. Here's a phishing scam targeted at finance department. Uh, a real looking email address can be set up by using information easily harvested from a social network. Scammers can now easily address your finance department on a first name basis using an account with your CEO real name and real picture, or alternatively gain access to the real accounts through a phishing campaign, letting them send emails from there directly. Here's an example of phishing scam involving invoice as attachment. Email containing fake invoice file with a zip extension. Okay, this file can contain Excel file with macros where where actually virus will be hiding email has one word subject line and one line message no signature okay so do not click on this here's an example of phishing email using eml attachment which is basically email attachment within an email and in this case an anti antivirus sees this as a valid file it has, doesn't see anything wrong with it and when you double click on that email file it will open an actual email 
And uh, this email will present multiple links and all of these links are malicious. They actually, when you click on them, they will take you to a malicious website, which will collect again, your login information. Here's a, a fake Microsoft notice, almost identical in appearance to an actual notice from Microsoft concerning unusual sign-in activity. This email points user to a phony 1-800 number and below has a link to a phishing portal where credentials are stolen. So look out for this type of emails as well. The actual 1-800 number, if you call, an actual hacker will actually answer your call. Here's a spear phishing example. A spoofed email is sent to a victim from IT department and is asking user to update their account by clicking a link. The link points to a fake website where credentials are stolen. So be aware, IT department will never ask users to click on any links to update user password or other information. So be aware of that. This is example shows that hackers can take advantage of COVID pandemic to send out links to help with safety measures. Once again, the link is pointing to a fraudulent site. Here's an example of mass phishing email used as a spam email template to warn the user that their computer has been hacked and their data was stolen, which is not the case. The email states, your computer hacked exclamation mark we have taken over your personal data if you follow the instruction attached to this letter and transfer us $100 we will simply delete your data so just to be clear this they don't they didn't hack your computer and they just are trying to scare you by threatening you so do not fall for this once a user opens the attachment of the malicious document, they are actually asked to click to enable content. And this is basically um, will enable the macros where the virus hides. So as soon as you enable that, the virus will be immediately installed by PowerShell command and um, a virus will be installed without you, without you even knowing anything. It will just start working in the background like nothing happened. So before clicking any links, you gotta stop, sync, and then connect. And make sure actually before you click, look for common baiting tactics. If the message looks suspicious or too good to be true, treat it as such. Be aware of messages asking for password or other personal information. Most reputable businesses and organizations will never ask you for this information via email. Never send passwords, bank account numbers, or any other private information in an email. Do not reply to requests for this information. Verify by contacting the company or individual, but do not use the contact information included in the message. Do not click on any hyperlinks in the email. Use your computer mouse, as, as I showed you before, to hover over each link to verify its actual destination. Even if the message appears to be in front of a trusted source, pay attention to the URL and look for variation of spelling of the different domains. Consider navigating to a familiar site on your own instead of using links within the message. Examine websites closely. Malicious website may look identical to legitimate sites. Look for HTTPS, S stands for secure. And uh, it's, you will also see a lock icon, green or gray color in the address bar before entering any sensitive information on the website. So if you get suspicious email, please forward it to your IT help desk for verification. If you do not have a dedicated IT help desk, make sure to mark it as junk. Now let's talk about the ransomware. Uh, ransomware is a malicious software that infects your computer and displays messages demanding a fee to be paid in order for your system to work again. This class of malware is a criminal money-making scheme that can be installed through deceptive links in an email messages 
instant message or website. It has the ability to lock the computer screen and encrypt important predetermined files with a password. Oh, uh, Danny, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, we have somebody with their hand up, and I was just wondering, did you want to do questions at the end, or do you yes, take questions at the end? At the yeah, end. Okay. Please, All you. right, just double checking. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Here's a list of known ransomware types. Uh, so let's take a, a look at each category, okay? We have cryptojacking, a ransomware, lockers, scareware, docsware, Mac ransomware, and ransomware on mobile devices. Let's take at each one individually. Crypto jacking. Crypto jacking is the unauthorized use of someone else's computer resources to mine cryptocurrency. In a typical workflow, users visit a website where crypto jacking operators have placed a JavaScript code that is loaded alongside the web page on the user's browser. This JavaScript code causes the user browser to mine cryptocurrency as a part of a mining pool. Any cryptocurrency and associated value from mining operations are kept by the cryptocurrency operator or hacker. When Froster hijacks user's device, the user notices a very extreme slowdown in their processing speed. So computer works extremely slowly. So you might be a victim of crypto jacking. The Ransomware basically causes a lot of damage because it literally takes all of your data and encrypts it and all of your files and folders and external drives including usb drives will be fully encrypted okay and uh, it will ask victims to pay a ransom in bitcoin to retrieve the data usually it is not recommended to pay the ransom but if you do not have any other backups uh, you basically have no choice and people usually pay it Locker ransomware is known for infecting your operating system to completely lock you out of your own computer or device, making it impossible to access any of your files or applications. A scareware is a fake software that acts like an antivirus or a cleaning tool. Scareware often claims to have found issues on your computer, demanding money to resolve the problems. Some type of scare locks, uh, locks your computer. Others flood your screen with annoying alerts and pop-up messages, as you see, can see here. So all of this, um, all of this actually viruses that it said it found 27 infected files. This is all fake, absolutely fake. And this is basically how they get you worried and scared. And uh, you basically immediately click on something and it will further infect your actual system. A docsware is commonly referred to as leakware or extortionware. Docsware threatens to publish your stolen information online if you don't pay the ransom. Just to be clear, the email shows a fake story which they try to scare you with, so do not fall for this scam. A Mac ransomware. A Mac operating system were infiltrated by the first ransomware in 2016 known as key ranger this malicious software infected apple user systems through the through an app called transmission which was able to encrypt its victims files after being launched similarly to pcs it's asking for payments in bitcoin a ransomware on mobile devices it began infiltrating mobile devices on larger scale in 2014. Mobile ransomware often is delivered via a malicious app, which leaves a message on your device that says it has been locked due to illegal activity. So ransomware infection methods. So let's take a look. So you can get easily infected by visiting unsafe or suspicious or fake websites. You can also get uh, infected easily by emails with email attachments like zip files or JS files. JS stands for JavaScript. And you can also be infected by malicious links on Facebook, Twitter, and etc. So the tip would be is um, you should consider using an antivirus that has a built-in antivirus web filter. Okay, and um, this is basically how it can 
show you actually when you browse internet which websites are safe to click on and which ones are not each web web filter for each different antiviruses works a little bit differently this is just an example of how one of them works um, so it actually gives you a visual kind of guidelines so the green basically means safe um, yellow means warning do not click and if you see a red one it means it's actually very bad link some basically do not show this and when you click on the website and if it's a bad one it will block your access it will actually show uh, a message on your screen that this website actually is infected so it will block you and it will not allow you to gain access Now let's talk about passwords. Um, it's very important to keep your password in a secure location, not under your keyboard or not on your monitor, as I normally see. Do not use paper or sticky notes. Do not store password in the clear text on your computer, such as Word, Excel, or text file. Utilize password manager on your phone. And we, as, as an example here, there's password managers called OnePassword, LastPass, RoboForm, all of them basically can be used up and installed also on the computer to help you fill in the password actual text box. And uh, you can also use um, IT Bistec password generator. Okay, just use this link anytime and it will actually provide you with secure passwords anytime. Also, uh, more tips here. Avoid using items that can be associated with your uh, with you, such as your address, your phone number, path name, birthdays, or child names. Have a separate password for each account. It's very important. Never share your password with anyone. Have a system with your password. For example, you can change numbers for each account, and this way it will be easier to remember. So, more tips create mnemonic password using random letters and numbers these passwords are easy to remember for example as you can see here wkyn okay uh, and or if you put it actually a dollar sign makes it even more secure okay and you can add um, other special characters uh, to make it stronger use uh, also password generators to help you can you can uh, always actually um, get a better better password with online password generators uh, make sure that your password is longer and at least eight characters long and it is recommended to change your passwords at least every year now let's talk about how you can protect your organization and um, this is something that uh, is very critical so it's very important to have a proper antivirus software installed on each computer. Do not use free software. It does not provide you full protection. So my suggestion would be to install actually uh, a, a proper subscription-based software that actually gonna give you much more protection, will include more features such as a web filter. Um, make sure to have operating system and software updates installed um, on ongoing basis. These updates include bug fixes that help defend from cyber attacks and and make sure to remove administrative rights from your own account. This is critical because that's what viruses utilize to get to install and, and spread through the network. They use administrative privileges on your account. So make sure to ask your IT support to remove admin rights. This way it will stop antivirus, it will stop actually viruses from being getting installed in your system and spread. Look out for phishing emails hover with your mouse over links to see actual destination okay back up your company data to secure cloud keep your data in a secure cloud do not back up to usb drives they can get encrypted like your data uh, on a local local to, locally on your computer if you do backup data to usb drives make sure it's not always plugged in so once the backup is complete you unplug it and put it in a safe place and uh, lastly, implement a cybersecurity insurance policy. Uh, cyber, cyber insurance is, is a type of business liability insurance that protects your organization against cybersecurity risks and data breaches. Cyber insurance can also help restore employee and customer identities, recover compromised data, and repair damaged computers and networks. Whether your organization is a victim of a data breach or social engineering, ransomware, or phishing attack. 
here is uh, more to how, how you can protect the organization and it's um, basically uh, towards it's more towards IT professionals um, and this is basically what you can ask of your IT professionals who help you with IT to implement in order to protect your email services so first thing my strong recommendation would be to host emails with Microsoft 365 premium subscription and uh, Microsoft is uh, actually providing a donation a grant for nonprofits and first 10 premium accounts are free and additional cost only seven dollars a user okay here I'm gonna basically show you the website and uh, this is basically showing you right here Microsoft 365 business premium for nonprofits okay it's a grant and it's free for up to 10 users. Additional users only $7 per month, and it includes advanced security, advanced cyber protection, advanced device management, and includes a lot more actually, and it also includes the licenses for Office 365, which includes Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and a lot more. So this is basically something, it's an absolute must have. Next is uh, work with uh, MSS, which is Microsoft Secure Score Guidelines. Microsoft Secure Score Guidelines is a measurement of organization security position with a higher number indicating more improvements action taken. The next one is enable MFA, which is multi-factor authentication. And MFA is an authentication method that requires a user to provide two or more verification factors to gain access to email or an application. Have an SPF record, send a policy framework. This is actually an email authentication standard that helps protect senders and recipients from spam, spoofing, and phishing. When you set up with Microsoft, this is the first thing they're asking you to set up, actually. Enable email encryption, DKIM, which is Domain Keys Identified Mail. DKIM is used to verify that no third party has tampered with data within an email. DKIM makes it much harder for spammers to spoof your domain. And DKIM, unfortunately, is not enabled by default by Microsoft, so that's something IT uh, professionals only can do, okay? And users will not have access to that. Next one is deploy um, deploy DMARC, which is domain-based message authentication reporting and conformance. DMARC ensures that the destination email system trusts messages sent from your domain. DKIM works with SPF and DKIM to authenticate mail senders. Using DMARC with SPF and DKIM gives organization more protection against spoofing and phishing emails. And uh, we're basically coming to the end and uh, this is just a few um, things about IT Bistec. We've been in business over 24 years and we provide free IT assessment and review. We manage client service and data, provide dedicated help desk and uh, we protect data from threats, we monitor servers and data 24 seven, and we provide secure cloud backups. Now we have time for questions and uh, I will be waiting for questions right now. If anybody has any questions, please ask questions. If um, Graham, if you can just um, tell me what the questions are, and yeah. I will gladly respond. For sure. Um, so for questions, uh, we, we had a few kind of come in uh, during the presentation, but uh, they were mainly just asking if the presentation would be shared after like the, the slide deck, um, okay. which uh, I, I think it w that was the plan, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We will share this presentation. Perfect. Um, and then I believe it's also being recorded. So, yeah. 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 We'll also send out the recording of this, too. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, we also had a question or question from Carla if we could have the names of the password manager apps sent afterwards. 
Absolutely, yes, you can do that. Yes. Perfect. I will send it with links actually, so it will be easier for people to find it instead of Googling them. Perfect. Okay, sounds good. Um, and I don't see any other questions in the. Oh, one just came up here. Um, so we have a question from Erica. Uh, it says, are there any brief info sheets to share with staff so they know what to look for in a suspicious email? We've had issues with phishing emails and need staff to know what, right. what to look for. What to look for. Okay, so basically um, in the slide, basically, I, as I mentioned there, that you should be looking for actually threatening language, spelling mistakes, fake links, okay, um, attachments that end up with zip or JS or um, uh, any any files that actually have um, macros enabled in them. So all of them has to be treated in a, in a very uh, careful manner. And if you basically uh, have suspicious feeling about this email, make sure to report it immediately to IT department. Let them verify that this actually email is good. And um, and basically, yeah, always look out for threatening language spelling mistakes and use the mouse to hover over the links. It will always show you the actual destination. It's a very easy thing to do. And I personally use it on a daily basis. I'm receiving a lot of different messages from everywhere. And this is basically what I use on a daily basis. And everyone should also do that. Perfect. And I think that uh, that I think there was a slide in the slide deck that uh, could be used, like if you wanted to, uh, Erica, if you want to like print off something for your staff to to have. Um, I bet you that there would be something there. Danny, would you be able to make yes. something like that? Or? I'll be I'll be able to create a a sort of like a, a one pager, yeah, and I'll send it to you in a PDF file, and everybody can print it out and have it on their on their you know desk or, or wall next to their monitor, and they can always like look up and and see for like like a reminder sheet yeah yeah that would be fantastic absolutely yeah you can always uh, send me your emails uh, to my email address shown on the screen it's danny at itbistic.com i'll be glad to answer any other questions you may have uh, in the future and um, thank you everybody thank you graham and thank you brand thank you everybody for attending i hope you guys learned something new and uh, you can always reach me uh, by email. You can always uh, reach me by calling me directly. This is my direct number and my email as well. So thank you again, and you guys have a good one. Awesome, thank you, Danny. Uh, and yeah, thank you, Brent and Oasis for, for um, helping us host this. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely, all right, thank you. Take care, everybody, bye-bye. Have a good day, bye.